I'm flattered if you think I set up this mistake just for the gag, but no, I genuinely do this about once a month. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm going to talk about a really cool operation that normally you only see the big kids do, line boring. Yes, you can do it on a small lathe, and I'm going to show you how right now. Line boring is all about flipping the script on your lathe. Normally you fix your parts on the chuck or a faceplate or something similar and the work spins and the tool is stationary. In this case, what we're going to do is put the cutting tool in the lathe and spin it up and we're going to fixture the work on the cross slide and we're going to feed the work with the carriage. You might do this if the part is too large to be spun up on your lathe or if you need a very long bore or if you need really maximum precision because boring bars always have some flex in them and tend to create more tapered bores. So step one for this to work, of course, is you need a cross slide on which you can fixture things. So if you're shopping for a lathe, look for one that's got T-slots or other ways to fixture on the cross slide itself. If not, maybe you can modify your cross slide to permit this. Next, we need to figure out how long to make the line boring tool, and it needs to be longer than you probably think because the bore that you want to cut needs to get completely clear of the tool bit on both sides. So you need double the length of your bore, plus a little bit of extra, plus some room for tail support, plus some room to hold it in the chuck. In my case, I'm planning ahead for a bore that I need to cut that's two and a half inches long, but it's in kind of an inaccessible area that requires a few inches of access to get to it. So I'm gonna end up with a bar that's about 18 inches long. Yeah, it really does add up. Now for some material, I'm using mild steel here because it's what I have, but something tougher like 4140 would probably be better. Because the tool itself is so long, of course, the battle here is rigidity. So you want this bar to be as thick as you possibly can and still fit within the bore you need to cut, and you wanna use the toughest material that you can. Predictably enough, we start on the lathe to prepare this stock to become a line boring tool. It's too big to go through my spindle bore, so I'm bringing in my steady rest here to add some features to the far end. Now, if you've been around the block once or twice, you can see the comedic error that I'm making right now. I don't see it yet, but just wait. Just move the carriage out of the way so I can get to that bolt. Still haven't noticed my error. Wait, is it clicking? Is it dawning on me? There it is. That's right, Quinn you have to have the carriage on the correct side of the steady rest before you set it up. So tear it all down, move the carriage to the other side. Luckily, my way cover that I made a while back has a quick release on the underside, so I can quickly get access to the ways on this side and reinstall the steady rest. And with that running well, then I like to throw the indicator on there and just run it down the side and down the top just to make sure my steady rest isn't deflecting that work too much. And that looks good. So a little way oil on there. Keep the rollers feeling good. And away we go. I will start by facing the end, as is tradition. And the goal here is to put a number two center in both ends of this stock for reasons that you'll see here in a moment. But we will start with this end. That steady rest, by the way, is a uh, shop modified steady rest. I started with the crappy casting that came with this lathe and uh, made all those other parts that you see there. There's a video series on that in my playlist if you're interested. With that end faced and punched, I flip it around and face and punch the other end. Facing and punching, not to be confused with punching faces, which is what I do with commenters that annoy me too much. I can't say I didn't warn you. The purpose of that, of course, was so that we can turn between centers. So I've got my turning between centers set up here. Lathe drive dog on one end of the work, driven by a pin in the backing plate on the spindle. And away we go on the other end to start turning. Now all I'm doing is a very light skim cut here to take the surface off and get this bar very nice and concentric. And honestly, this is probably completely unnecessary. A line boring tool doesn't actually have to be that precise. As with any single point cutting operation, as long as the spinning element has less run out than the final cut that you're doing, you're gonna get that concentricity for free. But I kinda wanted to just balance the mass to make sure it doesn't vibrate and you know make sure there isn't a bend in the stock or anything like that. So I feel like getting it straight, getting the mass nice and concentrically distributed around the bar can only help things. So now I can flip it around and set it up again, this time using a copper shim to protect the finished surface there and clean up the remaining side. The nice thing about turning between centers, of course, is you can take the part out, put it back, flip it around, and you never lose your concentricity. Over to the mill now, using the edge finder to find the center line there. 
And now I'm going to drill the cross hole for the tool bit. Now the key here is that the tool bit is not in the dead center of the bar stock. What you want is the cutting surface of the tool bit on the center line. Just like on the lathe, the top surface of the cutting tool has to be on center. Same thing here. I'm using a 3 16 inch tool bit here, so I've offset from the center line back half that distance so that the top surface of the tool bit is on center. And of course you gotta be thinking about which way the line boring tool is gonna rotate when you do that, because that offset is different depending on whether the bar is spinning one way or the other. Because we're drilling kind of offset on a concave surface like this, I'm gonna start by making a flat spot with a two flute center cutting end mill, just going down just enough to make a flat circle there. And then I come in with the center drill on that spot and start my hole there, and now I can drill through. This is the pilot drill size for the brooch that I'm going to be using. I'm going to be square broaching this, and square brooches have a pilot drill size specified on them, just like taps do. So be sure to use the right drill for that, or you're going to have a very hard time on the broaching step. In this case, for my 3 16 brooch, it specifies 193 thou as the pilot drill size. But they vary from brooch to brooch, so make sure to check yours. There's the round cross hole. You can see how it's off center there, which sort of messes with your head a little bit because normally cross holes are centered. Over to the press now to set up the brooch. This is a 3 16 square brooch that I bought from MSC Direct. Hashtag not sponsored. These things are not cheap, so be prepared for some sticker shock. But there are cheaper ways to do this, which I will talk about in a minute. Underneath the round bar there, I've got a cross drilling fixture, which is a V block with a hole in the center so the brooch can pass down through it. The key is to make sure the brooch is as vertical as you can possibly get it. I'm doing that by eye to make sure that as you press down on it, the brooch isn't bending and you risk shattering it then. And lots and lots of cutting fluid for this operation. And away we go. I lift the ram periodically to let the brooch straighten itself out again in case it was running crooked. If it springs back when you lift, you know you don't have it straight and you can adjust as you go to make sure you're not putting any bending forces on that brooch. And you are using a lot of downward force here, I will say. A 3 16 square brooch is just about at the very limit of this little two-ton press. Brooches need a lot of force, so don't underestimate that. I honestly don't think I could square brooch a hole larger than this. And of course, plan your exit strategy. Know where that brooch is going to go, because it will fall through at some point, and you want to make sure you've got something soft to catch it on, and that you've got room underneath for that brooch to get all the way down through the hole. Another way people do this is to create a single point broaching tool. That's just simply a square cutting point with clearances all around it. And you use the quill on your mill or your drill press to broach one corner at a time of your square hole. Now quills are not presses, so you cannot take heavy cuts doing that. You're going to want to do one or two thousandths depth of cut maximum so you don't damage your quill doing that. But that is a perfectly reasonable way to do it and lots of people do. Another way is simply to score up the hole with a file. It's easy to forget with all these fancy machines that Anything a machine tool can do, you can do by hand with a file. It just takes longer. A lot longer. But I've done my time on doing it that way, and it's really not that bad and not as hard as it sounds, so give that a try. Oh, and don't forget to square up the brooch relative to the stock, which I forgot to do, so you can see my square hole is a little crooked. Luckily, in my case, it's just going to add a little additional top break to the tool, which I can compensate for in the grind. But, you know, oops. The square brooch really impressed me with the accuracy of the hole that it cut. I actually had to deburr and sand this tool bit a little bit to get it to slide through that hole. Uh, so now that I've got that in there, I'll square it up again on the mill. I'm just doing this by eye, tapping it until it looks horizontal. It doesn't have to be perfectly square here. I'm just setting up to cut some set screws for retaining this bar in the slot there. So once again, cutting a couple of flat spots with a two flute end mill. And maybe one set screw would be enough, but I felt better putting in two, so I put in two. And then once again, these are center drilled and drilled tapping size for some set screws that looked like a good size that I happen to have in the drawer. These set screws were a little too long, so I ground them down and ground a bit of a dog point on them, so they'll grip into the tool bit a little better there, hopefully. Snug those down. And that is looking pretty good. The important thing is that those have to be recessed enough so that they won't, of course, drag on the bore when the bar is spinning in there. So they need to be lower profile than the tool bit is. Next up is to get that tool bit to the correct length. It needs to be long enough to stick out for the maximum bore that you want to cut, but not so long that you can't recess it deeply enough into the bar to clear the stock so that you can retract the bar without touching the stock. So getting this length just right is key. And to cut that, I'm using a cutoff wheel on the Dremel. You can see from the orange sparks here how hard this steel is. High-speed steel is tough stuff. Only stone tools are going to cut it. 
This piece of high-speed steel is from a scrap bin of high-speed steel chunks that I got, uh, I think from a viewer actually. It has a cutting edge ground on it from some previous machinist, and so I just honed that up and I'm doing a test cut here on some steel to see how well it performs. It cuts fine, the surface finish is solid, but it's got more lead angle than I would like, and I can feel that the tool pressure is a little high, and I want to make sure I've got minimal tool pressure, again, because I'm going to be battling low rigidity with this boring bar because of how long it is. I went ahead and reground that tool, and I put zero lead angle on it and left everything else pretty much the same. I evened out the top rake on it a little bit, and it's got zero nose radius on it right now, again, trying to go for minimal tool pressure here and that's cutting extremely well. It's breaking really nice chips. The tool pressure is low, I can feel on the hand wheels, but the surface finish is kind of poop. So I took a stone and put a little bit of a nose radius on it. And the difference is night and day now on the surface finish. A little bit of nose radius makes all the difference. So that finish is excellent, very happy with that. The method to my madness here is that I'm testing each portion of this line boring system individually so that if it isn't cutting well, I know that, for example, it's not the grind on my tool bit because I verified that the tool bit cuts very well on its own. Just like unit testing in software, you want to test all the components individually so that you know you can trust them when you try to combine them to do something complex. Okay, time for a test cut of this line boring tool. So I started by punching a hole in some scrap steel here on the drill press. My Weekend Warrior Grizzly drill press earned its keep here today, punching a one inch hole in this steel. And now I'm enlarging it with a boring bar up to the starting diameter of the final bore that I want to cut with this line boring tool. Now this is crappy mild steel that I always struggle to get a good finish in. So if this line boring tool performs well here, it should perform well anywhere. The line bore itself is only half the equation, of course. We need to be able to fixture to the cross slide. So that's up next. I measured the T-slots on my cross slide, and once again, I find myself making T-nuts. I swear I've made T-nuts in half a dozen sizes, yet somehow I still need to keep making T-nuts. I'm glossing over this because I've made two videos now on this channel about making T-nuts. I'm not doing a third. Nobody wants that. Okay, it's time to pull the compound and tool post off of there. So it's kind of a frightful mess under there, of course, so I'll get that all cleaned up. I'll slide my T-nuts in there, and they mostly fit, but I did actually also have to do a bunch of deburring on the T-slots in here. The factory had rammed that compound on there, probably with the pneumatic impact, and they chewed up the T-slots right around where the compound mounts there. So uh, these are the things you learn when you use your machines in new ways. Now the challenge with fixturing for line boring is of course you don't have any way to set the vertical position of the part besides packing blocks. So I'm starting with some one, two, three blocks here because they look like they'll be in the ballpark. And then I added some layers of copper shims until the boring bar looked visually centered in the bore there. For a precision bore, you have to be a lot more careful with this. And in a future video, I'll be showing how to set this up more precisely. But since this is just a test cut, just centering it in the bore by eye is plenty good enough. I made up these clamping bars out of some one inch square tubing that I had in the scrap bin and some long chunks of threaded rod there which thread into the T-nuts and this will allow me to clamp everything down nice and securely here. Of course the work needs to be square to the line boring tool as well which for this test cut I just used a square against the bar itself and the stock and that'll be good enough but for a real cut I would indicate this in. Of course for horizontal positioning you've got the cross slide so that's no problem. Really the challenge is just the vertical getting that centered. There's the tool bit there. I should note this is a normal right hand turning tool grind because I'm feeding the work left to right and so the tool bit relative to that is moving right to left just like a normal turning operation. You might have to use a left hand turning tool if your carriage only power feeds in the quote unquote normal direction towards the chuck. To set the initial tool bit position, just like anything else, you need to touch off on the work. But that's a little weird in this situation, so what you do is you feed the work over the cutting tool and then push lightly on the tool bit until it just touches the surface, and then pull the work away, and now you're touched off. And now I can set an indicator on the end of the tool bit. A flat tip on the indicator helps a lot with this. And you use the indicator to move the tool bit out the amount of the depth of cut that you want. And this can get a little squirrely because the tool bit has a tendency to get stuck in there with chips and getting chewed up from the set screws and so on. So take your time though, and once you've got it locked in position on the right value on the indicator, in this case I'm doing 10 thou depth of cut, then you're ready for your pass. Uh... 
The cool thing about line boring is that you can use your power feed on the lathe just like anything else because the power feed, of course, is moving the work in this case instead of the cutter. And away we go. You can hear it cutting there. It's a partial cut to start with. Now this is my first time line boring anything, so this is pretty exciting for hopefully both of us. Just like any other milling operation, it takes a couple of passes before you're doing a full cleanup, and then you can start working to dimension. So I did a half dozen ten thou passes just to get the feel of it. Things get interesting again once it's time to measure your progress. So in this case, because the part is not very deep, I was able to just move the tailstock out of the way and slide the part clear of the work. And I could do my measurements and checks here and then slide the part back over the line boring tool and put the tailstock back in place. For a part this shallow, you'd normally just use a boring bar. So more likely you're gonna be doing a very long part, which is why you're line boring and you're not gonna have room to do this. So in that case, what you actually have to do is remove the bar from the lathe, do your measurements, put the bar back in, dial it in again, and resume cutting. Now in my case, I'm driving the line boring tool with my four jaw chuck. So each time I remove the bar and put it back, I have to dial it in again. I didn't mind doing that and I felt it would be more rigid that way, but I know that some people do line bore with the boring tool between centers to prevent that problem, but things between centers, especially at this length, are a lot less rigid, so I felt I would get better results doing it with the four jaw. And here is the final result. Now, what shocked me is how good that surface finish is. You could honestly run a piston in that bore right off of the tool. That was shocking. So that part of it was an awesome success. This is a really cool operation to do. Even on a small lathe, you can do it, and it's gonna open up a lot of new possibilities for things I can do on my lathe that I otherwise couldn't. And I got a really cool operation coming up with this line boring tool, so stay tuned for that video. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks so much to my patrons who make all this possible, and I'll see you next time.